what I will do is next 10 minutes I could uh, accept maybe a few questions and what I request is we may not be able to get across to all of you since there are 38 centers. I could maybe take at the most one or two questions and my request is please use Moodle and uh, please put your questions there. We will get back to you and uh, as promised by Professor Fatak, this Moodle would be available for at least one year and we would be looking at your questions and let us make it a interactive session and a long term relationship. So, please upload your questions if anything was not clear in my lecture, please up, please put up your questions and I would get back to you. Thank you. So, we will we'll wait for any questions which you would have. We have uh, Tandai Periyar Vellur. So, can you ask a question please? Sir, sir. Hello, my question is uh, should BJT be called a current amplifier or a voltage amplifier? Justify your answer sir. So, what do you sir? Yeah. So, uh, we have not talked about amplifier so far. Now, when you talk about when my next lecture I will talk about it. So, let me uh, give you a quick answer to a question. The question is is a BJT a current amplifier or a voltage amplifier? Now, mind you BJT is not an amplifier, BJT is a device. You need to make an amplifier using BJT. So, you can have four types of amplifiers, a voltage amplifier, a current amplifier, a trans conductance amplifier and a trans resistance amplifier. We will talk about that in the next lecture. So, you can have both current amplifier and voltage amplifier using BJT. Thank you sir, over and out. Mofakkam Jha College, Hyderabad. Ask you a question please. One of my participant, I would like to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned about early effect. Uh, what are the other consequences of early effect? Yeah. So, the question is uh, about early effect. What are the other effects of early effect? Now, early effect comes into picture when the V C voltage is large. Okay. So, in a uh, normal amplifier where in a small signal amplifier the basic early effects what it says is if your V C increases collector current increases. So, think of any scenario where your collector voltage is changing then the current will change that is the issue. So, in a small signal amplifier this is not an issue because the collector voltage will not change beyond the DC value it will only change by very small values. But if you have an application where you have a large variation in the collector voltage then early effect comes into picture. But this is actually used to determine the exact value in most of the biasing circuits we neglect early effect. But if you want to be correct you would use it another place you would whether you would use early effect or current sources. So, in another few days uh, you would be hearing lectures on current sources IC current sources there you would see the expressions would use early effect also, but otherwise most of the biasing circuits we would ignore early effect. Okay. So, as a, as a first order approximation in most calculations we will uh, we'll, uh, ignore, but if you want to be more precise then we have to use early effect. Over. Uh, sir, one more question sir, what are the parameters which affect alpha and beta values? Over to you sir. Uh, what are the parameters that affect alpha and beta? Now, uh, my suggestion to you would be see in one lecture you cannot cover everything from uh, device to circuits. So, I just limited, but I, uh, I would I would ask you to refer to the book which I, I have given there. It depends on many parameters, for example, the you know concentration, doping, many, many, many parameters. So, if you look at any any textbook on uh, any modern textbook on devices you would see this. So, it is a parameter alpha and beta let us take just beta because anyway from that you can get alpha. Beta is a function of base weight uh, you know the doping and many 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 parameters at least 4 or 5 parameters of a transistor device parameter yeah over. So, maybe I can take another question we will stop. VIT Vellore we have selected you if you have any questions please ask it now over. So, can you please distinguish source bias as a universal bias from cell bias. We will come to this, but right now uh, can we uh, stick to questions which are related to what I did in the class. I, since you have asked this question I will uh, answer. The uh, 
the the bias which is generated externally which is independent of the operating uh, circuit that has to be distinguished from a bias which generates because of the flow of the current in the transistor itself so for example if you have a transistor which is drawing current and you put a resistor in the emitter lead then the emitter reaches a particular voltage because of the amount of current which is flowing in the transistor so the emitter is in this case self biased but sometimes you create a reference by an external potential divider or power supply or whatever and that leads to the uh, to the uh, reference uh, bias but we'll come to these when we have done the transistors what i would like to do today is to concentrate on uh, things we have done in the session that we have just completed so are the universal bias as and self bias same no no i gave you the difference no it depends on self bias circuits are those in which because of the operation of the transistor itself voltages and so on are established which causes this transistor to work properly okay so for example suppose you have a jfet this jfet is on you put a resistor in the source lead as a result the source reaches some positive voltage and if the gate is at ground potential there is a built in negative bias this is a self bias simply because you put the resistor in the uh, source on the other hand if you had created a voltage source by a potential divider and so on then that is not dependent on the operating point of the transistor so that's the other kind of bias so normally whether eventually the circuit configuration is the same or not is irrelevant the intention of providing the bias through the operation of transistor itself is called self biasing and otherwise you have the whatever term these are not standard terminology universal bias or voltage reference bias by looking at the uh, characteristics curve how can we know that uh, which configuration has a high impedance and a low, low output impedance input impedance which configuration common base common emitter common collector how can we know that this is not a characteristic of the transistor it's a characteristic of the circuit so you have to analyze the circuit of what kind of feedback it has what kind of connection uh, it has i'll leave it for professor john to answer the details yeah uh, see this is again a topic i'll take up in the next lecture now as uh, professor sharma rightly said you cannot talk about a device and impedance you have to talk about a circuit and the moment you talk about a circuit you have to look at it in detail so the concept of input impedance output impedance i'll be covering in the next class and that time please please wait till then and still i think in two lectures we can't cover everything so we can only finally maybe give you a few things so i think that that is the correct answer so you need to look at the whole circuit and then decide the impedance over kj somya mumbai uh, we have selected you if you have any questions please go ahead and ask over when i going for the fabrication of silicon diode or germanium diode the cut in voltage is 0.7 for silicon and 0.3 for germanium whereas this cut in voltage of barrier potential or you can say it is the built in potential you can vary by changing the doping but while solving the numericals in any book if you refer all you are getting for germanium it is approximately equal to 0.7 and for germanium it is approximately equal to 0.3 why it is so so what is the reason to stick to 0.7 for silicon and 0.3 for germanium actually uh, in my view these are terrible approximations uh, it is neither 0.7 nor 0.3 these voltages vary with current the reason why they work at all is because the dependence on voltage on current is logarithmic that means the current has to change by several orders of magnitude for the voltage to change okay so for example in case of silicon actually in case of any diode the value of the voltage across the diode is kt by q log i by i0 therefore this voltage is a function of i0 now if i0 is like say 10 minus 14 amperes or so 
then for a milli ampere of current you will have log of say uh, 10 minus uh, 3 divided by 10 minus 14 which is uh, 10 to the power 11. On the other hand if you had 10 times as much current even then the voltage will change by a few k t by q. Okay? So, log of 10 will be uh, to the base E will be of the order of 3 point something. So, about 3 k t by q a few millivolts. So, as a result the total voltage change for a very large change in current is quite small and it is decided actually by I 0 which can then be changed by choice of material doping etcetera etcetera. But the volt voltage across a diode is not constant it is logarithmic and because the log changes very slowly in these ranges for large values. Therefore, we take it as a quasi constant and taking of 0 0.7 and 0 0.3 are uh, really gross approximation. They work reasonably well in circuits which have reasonable amount of negative feedback, but we should not take these as overall accurate figures. And the leakage current is much higher in case of germanium because it has a lower band gap and that is why the corresponding voltage is lower, I 0 is much higher. Over. So, the second question is in case of diode if you try to measure the barrier potential that is 0.7 for silicon, so it is not obvious the answer is not possible. So, I read one answer from a statement is so, if you connect the probe across the diode, so that contact potential of the probe will cancel out the built in potential of the diode. But the second view in my mind is in case of depletion layer you are having uh, immobile charges that is the heavy atoms. So, the, if the, the atoms are not moving there is no flow of current, so it is not possible to measure the voltage across the diode or so. Uh, I think in this case Mr. Streetman is right, Streetman is right and you are wrong. Uh, for example, in case of a charged capacitor, you do not have any mobile charges and still you can measure the voltage. If you have a polarized dielectric, you can still measure the potential, you are not drawing any current from it. So, it is not necessary to have current flowing in order to measure EMF. For example, if you have a null measurement in which no current is drawn, but the voltages have to be equal for the bridge to balance, then it is not necessary for something to have uh, a, a have a mobile charges in order for the potential to be measured. Remember we are talking of an EMF and not a voltage. Uh, the reason for this is somewhat quantitative, but it is in fact related to what I talked about this morning. That means, the Fermi level and the Fermi level difference decides the overall measured voltage that you measure. And the point is that if the P and N sides have Fermi levels which are different, then so does the metal. And if you go around the full circle, then it has to add up to 0, otherwise you will be producing energy without doing any work on it. So, it is because of that reason that the local potentials adjust so that you cannot measure any voltage. It is in fact, I can give you counter examples in which you do not have any mobile charges. For example, a piece of wood charged to some very high voltage and now you want to measure without drawing any current from it, you can in fact measure the uh, EMF. So, it is not necessary to have mobile charges for an EMF to be there. Depletion charges can give you voltages. And in fact, the same diode that you are talking of, if you shift the Fermi level from its equilibrium value by shining light on it, then you do measure a voltage, otherwise your solar cells will never work. So, the idea is that the equilibrium value of the Fermi voltage is such that it adds up to 0. You have to disturb the, uh, the, the Fermi level by shining light, injecting current or take the carrier concentration away from the equilibrium value then the voltage will move from this value and only then you will see a voltage difference or an EMF. We will see a little more of this in my next lecture. MKSSS Pune, uh, if you have any question, please go ahead. Over. Hello sir, good afternoon sir. 
the reserve uh, related to BJT. So most of the circuits, the they have used the NPN transistor. So any explanation uh, regarding this, or due to this mobility or all these things, only the NPN transistor are using because there are mostly uh, high mobility electrons are there in both in both N or yeah. When you talk about uh, high frequency circuits, yeah, NPN is used. Uh, but otherwise normal circuits, I think there is no reason why you should have only NPN, but high frequency circuits, yes, frequency response point of view, yes. Actually, uh, the leakage behavior uh, makes a difference between the NPN and PNP and the differences are actually more technological than device physics based. So for example, if you have uh, the diffusion constant of boron is much higher than that of arsenic and so on which is used. So, if you use boron in the emitter is the most heavily doped region. So, if you use boron in the emitter region, then it tends to diffuse into the base and that does not give you such a good transistor. On the other hand, if you can use very shallow and very heavily doped emitters, then you get good transistor characteristics and that is possible only for NPN. So, the difference is not because of electrons and holes or because of device characteristics, the differences are technological and the diffusion constant of boron versus n-type impurity. Yeah, DOEC Srinagar, uh, please ask your question, over. The effect of temperature on uh, transistor characteristics, under that how would we expect that the transistor would constant current source when, uh, when there is a variation in temperature and uh, of course it is going to affect the collector current. Over to you, sir. The constant current source, uh, I mean, you can see it is true that uh, all these circuits are affected by temperature, but you can design uh, constant current sources. Uh, the way, uh, like for example, some circuits done is you would make the reference itself, you would make it uh, uh, temperature insensitive by having you know, senior and diode connected in series, one with a positive temperature coefficient and one with a negative temperature coefficient. So, it is possible there are I mean uh, ICs and all available, there are circuits available. So, okay, some of these questions will be coming up, over. We have another question. Hello sir, my question is for uh, Professor John. This is, he said in his lecture that VB is decreases by 2 millivolts when temperature is increased by 1 degree Celsius. I want to know sir, what is the operating temperature of BJT for proper functioning? And what will happen when temperature will decrease it by 1 degree Celsius? No, I'm no, I don't really uh, understand what exactly the problem. See, the issue is when you use a BJT, let's say in an amplifier, okay, like take a common emitter amplifier, which we'll talk about next lecture. See, what happens is uh, when when the temperature changes, the VB will decrease. So there will be a tendency for the because of the forward biased current to increase. Now, in a biasing circuit, by putting a resonance in the emitter there, you would counter that. Okay. So, that is the way it is done. So, in a circuit, this has to be taken care. So, this is why in a biasing circuit, you would put a resistor in the emitter. If you do not put, then this effect which we talked about right now will come into picture. So, the way you, this is why in a biasing circuit, you have to put a resonance in the emitter. So, that you get a negative feedback. So, any change in the temperature and the corresponding increase in the emitter current will be countered by uh, that uh, extra voltage which developed due to the increased current. So, I hope it is clear, over. Sir, I want to know what is the uh, temperature needed for the proper functioning of semiconductor devices? Actually, uh, first of all, the semiconductor devices should remain semiconductor. Now, uh, if you recall my lecture, what, what led to the generation of electrons and holes? It was the availability of energy. If we increase the temperature, we increase the amount of energy. This exponentially increases the number of electrons and holes available. Now, at some point, if the thermally generated electrons and holes become more than those provided by doping, then there will be no effective of doping. There will be no N type, there will be no P type and your device will stop working. Now, where this happens depends on which material you choose. 
for silicon this might occur around say 150 degrees to, to somewhere between 150 to 200 degrees centigrade. The typical commercial range of operation of transistor is considered to be 0 to 70 and the military range is somewhere from minus 40 to 100. So, this is roughly the range in which silicon devices work conveniently. On the other hand that does not mean that you cannot have devices working at other temperature ranges. At much higher temperatures you obviously need semiconductors whose band gap is more. So, that even with the availability of energy they will produce fewer thermally generated electron hole pairs and this will happen with wide gap semiconductors and wide gap semiconductors could be for example, diamond or silicon carbide. So, therefore, for operation at temperatures much higher than 150 to 200 degrees centigrade, we use uh, silicon carbide or diamond or special semiconductors whose band gap is in fact higher. At very low temperatures, there is a problem of freeze out and the freeze out occurs because we have been assuming that a dopant atom the extra electron or hole is so loosely bound that at any reasonable temperature it is free. So, therefore, each dopant contributes an electron or a hole, but if the temperature is very low this assumption will not be true and the energy available will be so low that even this loosely bound electron or hole will still stick to the original dopant atom and not become free for conduction. This condition is called freeze out and this typically occurs near liquid nitrogen temperature. So, therefore, the there is no definite uh, temperature range which can be given depends on the material. However, convenient ranges are from let us say 0 to 70 for commercial devices about minus 40 to 100 for military grade devices with silicon and much higher for silicon carbide and, uh, uh, and diamond based uh, semiconductors and all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperatures on the cool side uh, if you use careful design of uh, and choose materials properly. So, that is roughly the temperature range. Over. Yes, Saram Kanjipuram, we if you have any question, please ask. Actually, we have a student, I am asking this question. While we are taking class, we are asking a simple basic definition for potential and voltage. How we should answer for this? What is the difference between potential and voltage? We are using those two terms. How we should distinguish potential and voltage? Voltage is a measurement of uh, uh, potential. So, this is the difference between richness and rupees. You measure how rich somebody is by find, finding out how many rupees he holds. So, you measure the potential in volts. So, voltage is the measure whereas, potential is actually a measure of the potential energy. The word potential comes from the potential energy and therefore, if a charge is at some voltage then it holds energy equal to q times v and this energy is not because of its motion it is not kinetic energy it is potential energy and therefore, the corresponding voltage is called its potential. In order to measure it you measure it in volts and the number of volts is called the voltage. So, these are these are the, the difference is, is that of nuance. Uh, uh, you can you can say somebody is rich or you can say somebody has lots of rupees. K, K, K Wag Institute Nasik. So, please ask a question. Can you elaborate on the effects of leakage current on various regions? Leakage current. Well, uh, if I gave you a complete answer to this question, you will all miss your lunch. Uh, however, I will give you a partial answer. Uh, essentially, the uh, whether a semiconductor is affected more or less by temperature depends on its band gap. So, when we say that there is a certain amount of energy available, this energy as a function of temperature is given by k t by q. 
the question is what fraction is k t by q of the band gap. Now, germanium has a low band gap about 0.2 volts or so, it depends actually, uh, but the uh, sorry 0.7 uh, volts or so, but uh, silicon has a band gap of 1.1 electron volts. Therefore, the same temperature energy k t by q is a different fraction of the band gap voltage. As a result, the capability to generate electron hole pairs at the same temperature is different in the two materials and indeed as I talked in response to a different question earlier, if you had silicon carbide or uh, diamond, then the capability of the same temperature to produce electron hole pairs would be even lower. Therefore, at the same temperature, the number of thermally generated electron hole pairs is much smaller. Uh, in higher band gap materials, but it is much larger in germanium. The net result of this is that the number of minority carriers is larger in low band gap semiconductors compared to high band gap semiconductors for the same doping. The majority carrier is fixed by the doping, the minority car carrier is given by n i square divided by doping. So, if n i is small, the minority carrier is small by a squared ratio. So, uh, and the leakage current is caused by the minority carriers, because while the device is reverse biased for majority carriers, it is actually forward biased for minority carriers to go over. So, if you have lots of minority carriers, then the leakage current will be high. That is the reason that germanium and other low band gap materials have higher leakage. In fact, the built in voltage is also directly related to it. As I said earlier, it is given by k t by q log of i divided by i 0. So, if i 0 is high, i by i 0 is low, it is log is low and therefore, the built in voltage is low. Okay? So, one effect of leakage current is the built in voltage, higher the leakage current, lower the built in voltage. The other thing is that it is more temperature dependent. That means, with, sm with small changes in temperature, the number of carriers which become available, minority carriers which become available, thermally generated minority carriers, that increases much more for low band gap and high leakage materials. In terms of actual circuit performance, leakage current is often detrimental, because leakage current simply means that there is a temperature dependent component of the current, the bias shift the operating point of the transistor shifts with temperature and also the impedances are lower because there is a lot of current flowing and often the leakage current leads to noise because it is random in nature. So, as a result there are many detrimental effects of leakage current and uh, to honestly describe each one of them will involve uh, missing of lunch for I am sure uh, you, if, if your companions if not you will never forgive me for that. So, we will hold that for future for some time. Uh, thank you. If there are no further questions, we will break for lunch now. <laughs>